Um, Mr. Marshall, Marshall Luck, uh, please proceed with the uh, rebuttal. Good afternoon again. The, uh, there is only, again, Ali will be giving hopefully a short presentation followed by uh, Professor Newcomb. There's only really four points I want to make which are uh, uh, perhaps more factual in nature than the legal interpretation. The first is that um, in response to what El Salvador has argued, it says, well, my first point is that claimant's interpretation of the treaty is not at all at odds with the uh, interpretation of the United States. I disagree with the premise and the argument that they just made. I don't know what's proper and improper in these proceedings, but the interest of transparency less than a month ago received a call from our State Department indicating that opposing counsel was down there asking them to put an opinion on the thing. And would I like equal time? So we both had equal time. I went at a later time. We both had equal time to uh, re relate our views to the State Department. Um, the United States has chosen not to uh, make a submission in these proceedings at the end of the day. As to the other two states that have in connection with these proceedings, it doesn't escape notice looking at the Dewey and LaBeouf website that the law firm is representing those two countries. So to sit here and listen it, it, with, in all fairness to my clients, that everybody else in the world is against us, our, interpreta our interpretation of the treaty, it's just plain not true. Um, the other, when I watched, listened to the presentation again this afternoon, I mean, this is derived from uh, language, from snippets of opinions that do not relate to the particular facts before you or the particular issue before you, and that is whether or not um, we had to discontinue uh, local proceedings before we could even think about uh, filing a CAFTA proceeding. The comment was made, uh, and, and also uh, a lot of commenting was made suggesting that we did something once we gave our waivers to somehow upset it. We did nothing. Uh, the, the, the real complaint is that we did nothing that uh, we, we did not uh, file something with the, with the court down there. I, I agree. Uh, that's factually true. Did we do something to promote proceedings down there? No, we did not. Did we, uh, what was our, our mindset at the time? Our mindset at the time, again, is we received correspondence from El Salvador saying that no matter what you do now, uh, you have no jurisdiction and we're going to fight you on that point. And the, everything that they've said here today um, suggests that if we would have done like they say, dismissed, and then tried to dismiss the local proceedings and then refile a cap, that we'd be into a big statute of limitations fight. I mean, it's more than ever before clear to me today that perhaps that was the object at the time. I don't, I would agree with Mr. Smith that El Salvador was never required to teach us, our law firm, international law. Uh, on the subject, and uh, the correspondence that we received uh, was telling us what their interpretation of the law is. But I believe today, even more so than I've ever believed it before, that our interpretation of the law is correct, that we followed the plain language of the treaty, we did that what was required for us, we gave them a waiver that they could have presented anywhere in the world they wanted. They say this is unfair to a state that uh, how is the state supposed to know? We told them in our notice of arbitration where the pending litigation was. And then within a month after filing, they're in touch with the uh, clerk of the Supreme Court, but never once raised the uh, issue of, of the fact that they have the waiver. In fact, I'm glad we did not follow El Salvador's advice because I think we would be in a, in a very poor, poor position here today. Lastly, the last point is this. Uh, El Salvador complains that this preliminary objection proceeding is very expensive to them. Well, it's expensive to us, too. I mean, we're not a huge company. Uh, we, we, Mr. Newcomb, Professor Newcomb didn't get to that point in the presentation, but we would like to recover the costs that we've expended in addressing a motion which we don't think that uh, we were uh, that we were think we acted perfectly proper on in in terms of presenting them with a, 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 an exact waiver as required by the treaty and 
uh, and, and then having them tell us that's not enough, something beyond the language of the treaty is required, having to fight that and hopefully prevail on that issue. Thank you very much. The all-important watch. Sure, but don't worry about the watch for the time being, because the tribunal has three questions for you. If uh, you might, unless you would like first start the rebuttal. I I believe I I better obtain my copy of CAFTA before the questions start. If that. And I would invite you also to take a copy of. Um, I think your uh, response. Yes, Mr. President. Okay, could you please go to paragraphs 80 and 81 of your response? Yes. In paragraph 80, you start to say, the only measures at issue in the domestic proceedings, both capitalized, were the revocation of the environmental permits. So, and then uh, you go on, and they say, the claimant's notice of arbitration identifies a series of other measures. The uh, breach, CAFTA, and for investment law. My, my apologies, Mr. President. Are, are we in the the response or the rejoinder? The response. At paragraph? 80. 80. Th thank you. Yeah. My apologies. Okay, uh, uh, the okay. question again. If what you see here is in the first two sentences. It's stated... In, in, in the claimant's response, the only measures at issue in the domestic proceedings, both, both capitalized, were the revocation of the environmental permits. The claimant's notice of arbitration identifies a series of other measures that breach CAFTA and the foreign investment law. And then it goes on with first, the respondent decisions not to renew the claimant's exp exploration license are undoubtedly measures. And then if you go in 81, there's the second one. It says, second, the notice of arbitration claims that the respondent has imposed a de facto ban on gold and silver mining, which is arbitrary, discriminatory, and expropriatory. Could you help us? Where do we find those two points? Uh, of th those two measures complained about in the notice of arbitration, in the sense that they are presented as a, as a claim in this case. So let's take them in turn. So first, you have. The respondent's decision is not to renew the claimant's exploration license. Paragraph uh, 24 of the Notice of Arbitration says that uh, on January 29th, 2009, Commerce and Sam said you could count to file a challenge in the... Sorry, January 20, it says. Uh, it's my copy. January 20th, yeah. 2009. Commerce and Sam said legal counsel filed a challenge in the courts to the government's refusal to honor Commerce's Sam Seb's request to extend its expiration permits pursuant to the terms of the 2002 permits. So th those are the me those those are the measures with respect to. Were that not the proceedings that had already been resolved, or am I confused here? There, as as clarified uh, later, uh, or cl clarified by the respondent in its, I believe, their preliminary objection that there were not there were never any legal proceedings 
with respect to the exploration permits. There was an administrative review process, an internal administrative review process, but not legal proceedings before the El Salvadoran Supreme Court in the same way that there was with respect to the revocation of the environmental permits. So the, the, the reference to these legal proceedings have not been resolved uh, is, a, uh, is, is not factually correct. But it, yeah. Yeah. It, it, in, in the sense that the, the administrative review process is a legal process, but uh, with respect to the question of application of uh, the waivers, internal uh, review process, or, or the, the, our submission is that internal review processes are not caught by the, 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 you know, the, the waiver requirement. But could you help me, is down whether or not Proceedings have taken place about the uh, exploration permits. Are they measures complained about in notice of arbitration? Where is it that you complain about them in the notice? In paragraph 23, it says that on October 10, 10, 2006, Commerce applied to Marne for an environmental permit for its exploration in connection with the New, Seba New San Sebastian exploration license and the Nueva Esparta license. Marne did not respond to the request, and on March 8, 2007, Commerce Sans had applied to the El Salvadoran Ministry of Economy for an extension of these exploration licenses, as was its right. On J October 28, 2008, the Ministry of Economy denied Commerce and Sanseb's application, citing Commerce's and Sanseb's failures to secure an, an environmental permit. And that, that was an environmental permit with respect to the exploration licenses. But you see, if I look at paragraph 80 of your uh, response, you say what the Notice, you say that the claimant's notice of arbitration identifies a series of other measures that breach CAFTA. Yes. And then you say the first one is not to renew claimant's exploration licenses. Yes. And really the, 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 what I'm looking for is a place where you can find that indeed this is a measure referred to as a breach of CAFTA. In paragraph 26, the claimants refer to the, the government's ban on development of gold and silver mines applies in practice exclusively to foreign companies. And, and, and A, the government of El Salvador uh, asserts that the current ban on mining and si si silver mining and, the, and exploration connected with this mining stems from the government's desire to protect the environment, the government permits, uh, and, other, uh, and other activities. Could so you, there's... Must dispatch you. Uh, uh, slower, please. Yes. In paragraph... To, to, to okay, but can, can you please yeah. repeat it? Because what you're yeah. saying is that 20, paragraph 26 contains... Uh, an, ident uh, an identification of a measure that breaches CAFTA. And as the first one identified in paragraph 80 is not to renew the claimant's exploration licenses. And yes. 26 talks about at least the opening this, about a policy as applied that, this, this, that would discriminate against foreign investment. Uh, could you please help me with how we, I can connect the two? Article, paragraph 26A says that while the government of El Salvador asserts that the current ban on gold and silver mining and exploration, so there's, there's a, a reference to the, the fact of the current ban on gold and silver mining, we then turn to B, the government's ban on the development of gold and silver mines, and that ban on the, gold, the development of gold and silver mines we say is 
is a, is a, a de facto uh, moratorium or practice. Uh, and this, in, this would include the decisions, regulatory decisions, not to approve exploration licenses, not to uh, approve permits, environmental permits. And then in paragraph 30, there's a reference by its conduct, conduct referring to the, the government's ban on development of gold and silver mines, which includes the exploration licenses. I accept that there's the, the, the notice of arbitration is, uh, does not uh, set, that, set it, the issue up clearly with respect to exploration licenses, but our submission is that uh, it, is, uh, it is pleaded, that, the, that there was a, what one of the measures complained about is the denial of the, the, the denial of the exploration uh, license in, in paragraph 23. We're saying that this is in paragraph 26. We're saying that this is a a, a policy or a practice that discriminates against foreign uh, investment, and in, <coughs> and further in B elaborated as a ban on development, uh, development both of exploitation concessions and exploration licenses. The policy that's being referred to is the sort of the the uh, the, the sort of the, the de facto moratorium. Uh, paragraph 27 refers to the, this policy, and I would read that as this measure or this conduct, as applied, is arbitrary and rational, and has denied commerce of its property rights. And then paragraph 30 pleads the the reference to by its conduct, in reference to all of the previously enumerated paragraphs. By its conduct, El Salvador has breached these obligations. National treatment, MFN, minimum standard of treatment, and expropriation. Then I have a, f if everyone has a further question. Now the Supreme Court has rendered a decision on the uh, environmental uh, permits. Does that decision have any effect, either legally or factually, in the present case? Clearly it has an effect factually. It is an act of the Supreme Court. One of the uh, there's issues of minimum standard of, 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 of treatment in, in, in the claim, but the, the Supreme Court judgment was, it w made a determination that the revocation of the environmental permits was in accordance with the law of administrative procedure in El Salvador. And so we have a, a determination, a final determination of of the highest court in El Salvador that there was compliance. And so, so there's a, a sort of a final determination of a, of, of a court on that issue and that may have some type of, 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 you know, of res judicata effect with respect to, uh, you, know, deter, you know, factual determinations of El Salvadoran law. But the, the main claim in the arbitration is, is that there is a de facto moratorium on gold mining, the, despite the fact that the claimants have a concession which runs until 2034. In practice, as a measure, the government is not issuing any regulatory approvals and the, the acts since 2006, including the revocation of, our, of uh, commerce's permits uh, and the exploration license, is, uh, is, is, is uh, back, background to that, to that main claim, in addition to uh, you know, the, the other additional claims that are 
are submitted. Now, let's now hypothetically, for law professors, that's always a <laughs> wonderful exercise. Let's now hypothetically reverse the situation. And let's assume now that the Supreme Court would have granted the relief sought by the claimants. Yes. How would that have, have had an effect, if any, on the present proceedings? The claimant's submission is that the effect of the waiver is definitive. And we, that, with respect to there's a, waive, a, a waiver of rights to continue and initiate proceedings with respect to the environmental measures. The claimant's submission is that if there had been a final determination in favor of, of commerce, that there was a breach of, of El, El Salvador law and that commerce was awarded $100 million, that the waivers would, weigh, would, would be operative and legally definitive to extinguish and abandon any right that the claimants had to the benefit of that judgment or to initiate proceedings, initiate, because we also waive the right to initiate proceedings with respect to any enforcement because, of course, there's a, a court judgment that says El Salvador must pay $100, but if El Salvador doesn't comply with that, there would still have to be enforcement procedures. And the, our, our, our view is that the waiver, given its, its definitive effect and wide effect with respect to the, the measures at issue, would, in, would include anything. So that, that goes back to the, the position that the, the, the waivers provide a complete release uh, to the state with respect to any, uh, any legal rights or legal rights that the claimants might have with respect to those, those future proceedings. From, once the waiver is submitted, those proceedings from the point of view of the claimant are essentially, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the, quite the exact word is, but that, that the idea is that the claimants would never be able to obtain any benefit from, from a, a favorable judgment given the waiver having definitive effect. But would it then not work also in the same way with, uh, with regard to the previous uh, question of the tribunal? Um, what you're saying now, as I understand, is the waiver operates as uh, an obstacle to giving any effect to the Supreme Court judgment in case it would have been in favor of the claimants. That's my understanding is correct. Yes. Would then also have been, have been an obstacle in respect of the situation that actually occurred that they deny, rejected claimants' relief. That also has no effect whatsoever. It has no effect from the, for, the, for the purposes of El Salvadoran law, but the, the claim, the, the, the CAFTA claim. No, is, oh, let's let back, yeah. back track. Assume now you, you, you would have won in, 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 in El Salvador, you were the, the, the claimants. Could you still pursue the claim in the, in the present case? Yes. Because the, 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 the claimant has complied with the jurisdictional requirements in the, in, 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 in the waiver. The, the, the win in El Salvador is, is a determination with respect to whether the revocation of the environmental permits were, were valid under El Salvadoran administrative law. They don't make any sort of determination with respect to CAFTA breaches. And uh, the, the, the claimants would be able to, uh, in our submission, be able to uh, continue to make a, uh, <clears throat> submissions with respect to the, the breach of CAFTA obligations based upon the revocation of the environmental permits. I see.
Still, the tribunal has some questions in the hypo that you that the claimants would win in uh, in El Salvador, and your submission is that you could not collect you the, the, being the claimants on the, on the on the judgment in El Salvador because of the waiver. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But how does it work? Because the Supreme Court has issued a decision, and in your you you completed the hypothetical by saying, oh, "Let's assume that yeah, we got our 100 million." In damages. There's not only because you, you was also at the same time were claiming damages in that procedure. Yes. Okay. Yes. Assume now and now, how does it operate? So you, you basically you could collect the judgment. And how does it operate that under Salvadorian law? Could them the respondents say, wait a moment, you waived your right to continue court the proceedings. Yes. You could, and now I, I go on. You cannot say, oh, wait, well, yeah, proceedings are over. I have now a judgment against you. How does that operate under, under, under Salvadorian law? You can simply could then the, the respondent say, well, no, no, I, I, here I have a waiver of you. Whereas the, there's already a judgment on by, by, the, by the Supreme Court. Mr. President, I'm not a, a licensed attorney in El Salvador. We, we do not have uh, El Salvadoran law on that question of what the, um, what the effect would be. Our, our submission, given our view that the waiver is a complete extinguishment of all legal rights, any legal rights with respect to those proceedings or benefits from those proceedings, that there is just absolutely no opportunity for the claimants to obtain uh, a, uh, a, a benefit. And our submission would be that that the, uh, that the uh, Attorney General uh, would be able to submit a, uh, a, the, the waiver uh, to the courts to show that there had been a, this complete abandonment of rights, as was done uh, in the uh, the Venezuela the Vanessa Ventures case, I assume has not done so. Uh, this, then the Attorney General has waived from his side the right to invoke the waiver. Is that your position? Because it gets now complicated, and all this would not have happened if, one way or the other, before the judgment had been issued, somebody had told the court, "I think you should stop," because the there is now the, the proceedings have been relocated to an international arbitration. And we have here a waiver. We go back to our, our, our fundamental s submission that CAFTA does not pr prevent or prohibit concurrent proce proceedings. The, 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 the mere fact that uh, the El the mere fa if the El Salvadoran Supreme Court had issued its judgment on June thirtieth, and then claimants had, had commenced arbitration on July 2nd, there would be no issue. So the, the, the mere fact that there is a, a definitive judgment of the El Salvadoran Supreme Court with respect to the revocation of the environmental permits, uh, that, I mean, that is not a problem for the purposes mm -hmm. of the CAFTA arbitration. Let, let's not further complicate I mean, the, the, the hypo, because we're not talking <laughs> about proceedings that have ended before yes. the 2nd of July. 2009. Are we talking about something that still is going on on the 2nd of July 2009? And there we uh, we, we wonder how it, how this works. Uh, if you do not do any do not take any step in the, those proceedings uh, because of the commencement of the arbitration, but what you what then hap may happen is that you are running on two parallel tracks. If not, if somebody does not say, uh, wait a moment, stop here. Yes, and our and our submission is that respondent states in some in some situations may want, after having engaged in three years of of litigation, to have a resolution of a, a an issue such as uh, uh, as this determined, and that there's nothing in CAFTA that uh, prevents that. What what if this was, for example, test litigation, and this was one claimant, and there were a hundred other claimants in the similar situation in El Salvador, the, the state might have a, an interest in having a definitive resolution on, on, 
on this on this issue that would then you know would be useful for the for the state. So it goes back to the the submission that the the, the fact that there was a final decision of the Supreme Court on a specific matter of El Salvadoran administrative law is 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 a fact, but that it doesn't one affect the jurisdiction of this tribunal, and this tribunal can can proceed to make determinations of whether El Salvador's conduct breaches CAFTA obligations and the foreign investment law. Uh, after you have finished your uh, rebuttal, we would like to ask the, also the respondent to comment on, on this question, if they wish so. But, uh, unless uh, you would think that we, the respondent should already now comment on this, this question, then we can dispose of it now, if that's procedurally proper. Uh, but, but now we are really de deviating from the beaten path of you and our rebuttal. I, I'm in your hands, Mr. President. If, if Mr. Smith would like to address the question now, I'm, that is fine with me. Or Mr. Smith, if you would like to, I, I think we can, then we have to finish this question, if, 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 if at all uh, you are in, in, in a position to do so. You can, there you go. Michael. I think that the, the hypothetical has, has become somewhat complicated, but I, I, I guess the question is, um, or, or part of the question is, at least, is, is, is what would be the effect uh, on this proceeding, and particularly with regard to the waivers, if the Supreme Court of El Salvador had decided uh, in favor of the claimants issuing them an award for a hundred million dollars. Um, the claimants take the position that they would have, because of the waivers, they would have no right to collect on that award and that they have renounced all rights. A first point to make is I very seriously doubt that had the decision gone their way that they ever would have taken the position that their waiver presented them from collecting a hundred million dollars. That is a position that they can take now because it is coherent with, in some sense, with their position uh, on the waiver, but uh, if the, the case had gone the other way, um, I would find it very surprising if they would interpret it, their waiver uh, to that extent. Um, what would the effect have been on these proceedings? Uh, the measures at issue before the Supreme Court of El Salvador were the revocation of the environmental permits. Those are the measures that give rise essentially to 100% of the claims of the claimants. At the time that their environmental permits were revoked, they lost their right to their concession. Every right that they had in El Salvador was ended. Nothing that would have happened after 2006 when they lost those permits could have caused them any further injury. They have no claims for measures taken by the government of El Salvador other than that. So just let me finish. So if the Supreme Court of El Salvador has decided that those measures were invalid and issued an order for compensation, there would be no further issue in this arbitration. Let me ask, let me ask you then. One step further. The hypo was that, indeed, as, as you, you, you stated, uh, that the claimants would have won, prevailed in, in, in the court case. And then the question was, under Salvadorian law, could you invoke 
the waiver. Now, there are two aspects to this. First of all, a procedural aspect, because you, ha you have already a judgment against you. And is there still a possibility then to invoke the waiver? And the second one is, even if there's a possibility to invoke the waiver, since you have previously taken the position that the waiver is invalid, can you then still say, well, wait a moment, after, after all, I have now second thoughts about this, the waiver is, uh, is valid. A decision of the Supreme Court of El Salvador would be binding on the government of El Salvador. The existence of the waiver would not be something that the government could, as a legal matter, um, use to oppose the enforcement of a binding judgment of the Supreme Court of El Salvador. The government would be obligated to pay the award because it is an award of the highest court of the government. Thank you. That's uh, okay. Um, Dr. Nolan has some question. I'm sorry, is that a statement of counsel or is there any authorities behind that? Because this seems to be an important issue. And the same, my question is also to attorney to the claimants. Whatever you have said regarding the effects of the waiver, is that your position or is that supported by some authorities, president? And the question goes to both parties. Because I've seen assertions in, in one sense, and the contrary assertion on the other, and I want to know, legally speaking, where we stand under Salvadorian law. Let's first start with the yes. with Mr. Respondent on this one. Okay. okay then, um, then we finish this one because we actually in rebuttal time. Right. Okay. Um, they, they uh, simply we we have conferred with a representative of, of the Attorney General's Office of El Salvador, and that was the opinion he related to us. It is not based on a, a review of, of court cases or decisions. If, if the tribunal would like uh, further documentation on this issue, we'd certainly be willing to to provide it. Please also f uh, finish this point, and yes. then uh, you can re you start your real rebuttal. Our submissions with respect to the waiver in El Salvador are, are, are submissions that are not based on we don't ha do not have uh, legal opinions of local counsel in in, in 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 the materials. One point, however, is that if we're thinking of the waiver, it's sort of one question is sort of what is the law that if applies with respect to the requirements for the waiver and my submission is that the the effectiveness and requirements for the waiver must they not be determined by international law uh, why is it that El Salvador law is controlling particularly where the waiver requirement applies in different captive parties and so why are we so focused on El Salvadoran law our submission is that CAFTA as an international treaty requires a certain form of legal document to be provided. That's, and, and, and it was provided in accordance with CAFTA. So really, in some, in some sense, and, and I know there have not been submissions on this, may, the, the question it seems to me more about whether the waiver is effective under, uh, as, a mat, you know, as a matter of sort of treaty interpretation under international law. The question is, is not so, so much about the waiver in and of itself. The question is how you can procedurally invoke it once yes. the Supreme Court has issued a judgment. Yes. yes. And, and is there a procedure in place then to invoke the waiver? And then especially because there's, 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 there's this is an added aspect to this is that it may well be that the party that in this case Salvador in, in the hypo cannot invoke the waiver because they have previously taken the position that the waiver is invalid. Yes, I understand. The additional issue uh, I would su suggest is in, in, in many uh, court procedures in many countries there is an op there's an uh, opportunity to apply for a revision of a Supreme Court judgment. So if, to the extent of a court decision based upon information that was not before the court at the time. So if, if the court did make a decision, uh, a final decision uh, in favor of the claimants, again, would it, uh, would it not be uh, available to the uh, 
to the Attorney General to make a submission for revision of that decision based upon new information that was not before the court. And I, and I would submit that, that in, most, uh, inter in most domestic court procedures, that procedure is available and would be, uh, would be uh, e e effective, and you'd have a similar situation that we had in Vanessa Ventures, where the Constitutional Chamber of the Venezuelan Supreme Court dismisses the action based upon the waiver. I, I, I know Thank you I'm for all these, these, uh, uh, these, uh, these answers. You can now proceed with the... Uh, Thank you. Rebuttal. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, in, in, in light of the uh, time, I will try to use the utmost economy in making uh, my uh, submissions uh, brief. My next uh, submission from this morning uh, is the, the point that S San Sebastian was not a party to the domestic proceedings. The, the record in the, in the domestic proceedings is clear that only commerce was a party to the proceedings. The court judgments highlight that the environmental permits were issued to commerce. The Marne resolutions in question revoked commerce's permits. The notifications refer to commerce as the party. The judgment only refers to uh, only to commerce. Uh, my submission is if, if, if San Sebastian had sort of moved to discontinue the domestic proceedings, the court's response would have been clear. San Sebastian was not a party to the proceedings. Now, you are now on slide 57 of your yes, presentation. Yes, on, on, on slide 57. Okay. The, the fact that the claimant's lawyers identified himself as the attorney for both companies, which operates as a joint venture, I, we submit is not relevant to the question of whether, of whether San Sebastian was a party itself to the domestic proceedings. Further, the, the claims by San Sebastian in this arbitration are as San Sebastian as a, a, a separate entity which has uh, an investment in the joint venture. In, investment in CAFTA uh, is defined to include sort of an, an, equity, an equity participation in a, an enterprise. And an, enterpri and an enterprise is defined in CAFTA to include a joint venture. Sanseb's investment was its was its participation, uh, its, its ownership directly and indirectly in the, in the joint venture. And also, Sa San Sebastian had separate uh, investments in El Salvador, including the, 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 the lease on the actual, on the mine. The, the point is that in this proceeding, the claim is not being made uh, by the investor on behalf of, the ent uh, of an enterprise in El Salvador. This is not a claim where commerce is claiming on behalf of uh, the Commerce Sanseb joint venture under Article 1016.1b of, 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 of CAFTA. There's the, the provisions about claiming as, as an investor in your own right and claiming on behalf of the enterprise. So, the, the, the question is not, the, the, the issue is not, ab not about uh, whether commerce uh, was acting uh, on behalf of the joint venture in the domestic uh, proceedings for the purposes of, of, the, of, of CAFTA. The, for, for the purposes of CAFTA, San Sebastian is an independent uh, investor with an investment which includes an equity participation uh, in uh, the, in the joint venture, it's claiming for, uh, for damages for the effect of El Salvador's measures on the, on its, uh, sorry, its, its, its investment. And its investment is the equity participation in the joint venture, plus its, its separate uh, investments which it contributes to the joint venture. So in, in, so in response, uh, our, our submission is, is that uh, Sanseb uh, is, is uh, the, the waivers uh, did not apply to, uh, to Sanseb uh, and the court record makes that, uh, makes that clear. 
Finally, with respect to the, the tribunal's jurisdiction with respect to the foreign, uh, foreign investment law issue, uh, I would just highlight that the, the, the claimant's notice of arbitration uh, re requests arbitration both under CAFTA and Article 15 of the Foreign Investment Law. Uh, there is an issue with respect to uh, the, the particulars claimed by the, uh, by, by the claimant uh, with respect to the breaches of the uh, Foreign Investment Law. Respondents this morning have, have raised an issue about whether the, there was consent. We, we, we submit that there is consent. I, I, would, just, I would just note that the, the issue of, of sort of whether there is jurisdiction uh, with respect to the foreign investment law was not, was not really a, an issue that was pleaded in the preliminary objection. In my understanding, with res the preliminary objection was, was, was primarily focused on the issue of whether there was consent uh, under CAFTA. Of course, we do submit that there is uh, the separate uh, consent to arbitration under, under the foreign investment law. Uh, with respect to the issue of ancillary claims, we uh, claim, uh, claimants submit that if uh, that if the the, the pleading uh, with just with respect to naming the foreign investment law is in, insufficient, that uh, we claim uh, to to make a, an ancillary uh, claim uh, with respect to certain uh, breaches, uh, and that we rely on on, on various authorities uh, on, on 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 ancillary claims, including uh, in Enron. Uh, I'll just note, and this is in Professor Schur's uh, commentary, uh, which is not, has not been submitted as a, a legal authority, although with permission I, I, would, I would submit it, that in Enron, uh, uh, the tribunal decided to accept the new request for arbitration as an ancillary claim. So to the extent that there are uh, uh, deficiencies with the notice of arbitration, our submission is that based upon ICSID, uh, uh, ICSID rules are based upon the convention that uh, we can submit an ancillary claim to uh, address uh, any of those uh, deficiencies. Further, with respect, the, respect to the uh, foreign investment law, the waivers do not prevent the claimants from bringing claims in this arbitration based on the foreign investment law. The CAFTA waiver is a waiver of a right to bring another separate proceeding under another dispute settlement procedure. These are, these are, are not two proceedings, there are not two proceedings in this case. In this case, we have one proceeding based on two consents to arbitration in which the CAFTA is making claims both under CAFTA and the foreign uh, investment law. And we, we submit that uh, the PACRIM decision on, on, on this uh, is, uh, is persuasive. The whole purpose of the waiver requirement is not, is so that there's not concurrent proceedings. Uh, so the whole purpose is to ensure that, that claims are brought in, uh, uh, in, 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 in one form. Sorry, I, I, may I just ask a question about that? Yes, um, Mr. Thomas. The question I have relates to the structure of Article 10, 18, 2, the last limb, where we get into the waiving of other procedures. And I think, I, I take your submission to be that under the foreign investment law, the consent to exit arbitration there would allow the claimant to bring before this tribunal claims in respect of the revocation of the environmental permits. Yes. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Okay. If that's correct, I, I just let draw you to your attention to the use of the word wording any proceeding with respect to any measure alleged to constitute a breach. And the question I have for you is how do you differentiate when we're talking about the environmental permits revocation, how do you differentiate between a cause of action based on local law, municipal law, a cause of action based on the foreign investment statute, 
and a cause of action based on the treaty. Where do you find the right to have a different cause of action in respect of the same measure? This is what I'm having trouble with in your argument. To be, just to be absolutely clear, isn't it really, isn't the focus here on the measure? If the measure has been challenged in a claim for damages in whatever forum ca captured by that language, yes. yes, isn't that what we, the tribunal should be focusing on, on the measure as opposed to the cause of action which gives rise to the claim? Th thank you for the, the clarification. Our submission is that if the claimants commenced a separate arbitration proceeding under the foreign investment law, that the waiver would apply. Because the reference is to any proceeding with respect to any measure. And, we're, and, and, and in, that, in the context of any proceeding, the focus is on proceedings other than the CAFTA arbitration. And that there is only one proceeding. There's only one ICSID proceeding and that the waiver does not, would, would not apply when the, the foreign investment law is brought into the same proceeding. And, and it goes back to the, 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 the whole purpose of Article 1018 is, is, is with, primarily with respect to ensure that there's not concurrent proceedings with, with respect to the same measure and all the difficulties that that arises. In this case, there'll be one tribunal making the determination. Uh, there, so therefore, there's, there's one, there's not concurrent proceedings. There's no problem with respect to concerns about inconsistent decisions or double recovery. Uh, and uh, in our view, the, 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 the PAC-RIM decision uh, supports that, uh, that in interpretation. Sorry, just uh, th yes. this is just the last question on this point. Yes, I know you, you wanted, but the provisions of the CAFTA, which provide for the submission of a claim to arbitration, list what can be alleged to be at issue in the arbitration in Articles 10 and 16, and and they only refer to either an obligation under Section A or an investment authorization or an investment agreement. They don't refer to any other legal regime that can be the subject of a CAFTA claim. Do no, the, but the, the, this, this, uh, this proceeding uh, involves both the consent to arbitration under CAFTA and the consent to arbitration under the foreign investment law. The reference to If I may say that this, with respect, in Article 1018.2, the provision says, the very last, any right to initiate or continue before any administrative tribunal or court under the law of any party or other dispute settlement procedure, any proceeding with respect to any measure. Now, it's not any claim with respect to any measure, right? If it was any claim with respect to any measure, then, then, then the idea would be that you can only bring, you can only bring CAFTA claims, but the the focus is on is on uh, any any proceeding. So you, you you waive the right, and the the waiver of the right only extends to other proceedings. But with with within the CAFTA, uh, sorry, w within this arbitration, which is one proceeding, uh, any type of claim. Uh, based upon consents in other instruments can be, can be brought. Thank you. Uh, finally, just with respect to the foreign investment law issue, I, I, would, I would just highlight the respondent argues that the waiver uh, is uh, the, the claimant's waiver is effective with respect to the foreign investment law claims, uh, although we, which we of course uh, reject. But of course, at the same time, they're also saying that it's not was not effective vis-a-vis -vis the domestic uh, proceedings. In our view, the the, the waiver uh, the waiver is effective with respect to the domestic uh, proceedings, uh, but does not uh, prohibit uh, 
to have uh, one proceeding involving two consents. I will now turn to uh, just a, a number of the uh, of, of, of questions and uh, issues uh, in, in, in response. Uh, with respect to the tribunal's uh, question with respect to uh, the dissenting opinion of Mr. Hyatt, in the response, we, do, we didn't, didn't, do not suggest or we do not suggest or claim that Mr. Hyatt's dissenting opinion is authoritative as a statement of the meaning of the decision of, of, of waste management. We refer to the decision of, of Mr. Hyatt to highlight the, sort of the treaty interpret, uh, a point about treaty interpretation which he makes about if NAFTA had contemplated the termination of domestic litigation as a jurisdictional requirement, well, you would have expected the treaty drafters to have that express requirement. So it's, it's more to, to just highlight and draw upon our argument about treaty uh, interpretation. Uh, second, we refer to uh, Mr. Hyatt's dissenting opinion for the principle that there is the distinction between jurisdiction and admissibility and that post-waiver conduct is an issue of, uh, of, uh, of admissibility. Our submission is not that Mr. Hyatt's dissenting opinion was the correct determination of the case. As I submitted this morning, our submission is that the majority of the Waste Management Tribunal was correct to find that there was no jurisdiction because in that case there was a defective waiver because at the time of submission, because it, it, the claim, the investor in that case carved out something from the waiver and it was uh, not, uh, not e e effective. Uh, clearly, uh, dis uh, I, mean, I, I, would, I, I would agree that dissenting opinions in international arbitration are, are I mean, they're clearly not binding, depending on the, on the, the strength of the reasoning. They, they, may, they may be persuasive in, in, in certain circumstances, like, like any other uh, uh, legal authority. With respect to the issue of whether there's an agreement between the CAFTA parties with respect to the interpretation of CAFTA, I would highlight that the various statements of the CAFTA parties which have been uh, referred to by the respondents on the requirement for conduct uh, focus more on the question of the requirement for conduct consistent with the waiver. So the, most of the submissions for example, for example uh, the, the U.S.'s submissions in, in Tembeck argue that the claimant's conduct subsequent to the waiver can negate the waiver because of, uh, of, of post-waiver sort of conduct. In this case, the interpretive issue is with respect to whether there is a requirement to discontinue prior to submitting, uh, prior to submitting a notice of arbitration. And there's, there's the various statements of the CAFTA parties are primarily addressing the post-waiver conduct issue. They're not addressing the specific treaty interpretation issue. So there, there's, there's not, there clearly is an agreement on that issue and, uh, and there is, uh, because, and because primarily the, the, the CAFTA states are referencing post-waiver conduct. Finally, CAFTA provides an express procedure for binding interpretation uh, of, of provisions and that uh, has not uh, been used uh, in, in, in this case. On the question of could El Salvador have discontinued the domestic the proceedings, the, the respondents uh, have submitted uh, this, this morning that the respondents were powerless to have the domestic proceedings dismissed. First, we would note that El Salvador never requested the claimants to take the active step to discontinue uh, the proceedings. The respondent never notified uh, the court uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the waiver. Respondent suggests that, the, that only claimants could request termination. Uh, however, the Attorney General's opinion only addresses the, 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 this, this, this mission uh, that um, came uh, in on, on Friday only addresses whether the claimant can discontinue the claim. And we, we agree that the claimant, there is the possibility of the claimant discontinuing the claim. The Attorney General's uh, opinion and those ma the materials do not address the question of 
whether it is impossible for the Attorney General to have the proceedings uh, di di dismissed with the waivers in hand. We would note that Article 40 of the Law of Administrative Litigation refers to discontinuance by the claimant or discontinuance of the claimant. And it's not clear why the waiver could not be considered itself a discontinuance uh, by, the, uh, by the claimant. In, in the claimant submission, the material before the tribunal does not, does not prove that, the, that we, there's just simply not evidence uh, before this uh, tribunal that, the, that El Salvador was po powerless. What the materials establish is that the claimants could have discontinued. But there is the, uh, un, the, 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 the point is, 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 is not established that the, the respondent could not have submitted the waiver to the court, again, as, as, has, has, as was done in the, uh, the Vanessa case. Mr. Smith made the point uh, that the waiver includes the requirement to act in conformity. The, the difficulty with this submission is that it then means that jurisdiction is not determined at a particular date because if the waiver includes a, the, uh, the requirement to act con in conformity with the waiver, well then we have a sort of a situation not where jurisdiction is determined on the date of the submission of the notice of arbitration, but a, submission, a, a, a situation where jurisdiction sort of floats in the, in the air and it then depends upon the subsequent conduct uh, of, the, uh, of the claimant. And we submit that this is not the, the, the regime that is established by, by, by CAFTA. Jurisdiction is determined as of, uh, as of uh, the, the date and there is no sort of post-waiver post conduct is, is irrelevant to the, the, the jurisdiction of the tribunal. Mr. Smith suggests that our submission is that the claimant has the obligation to do nothing and may initiate proceedings everywhere. That is not our submission. Our claimant's submission is, is is not that they can, uh, they can uh, engage in an abuse of, of process. We've, we've been very clear that the tribunal has a, a supervisory mechanism to ensure that claimants do not act in good faith. The claimants accept that, that uh, the claimant has an obligation to arbitrate in good faith that the tribunal can, uh, can, can control uh, the, the use uh, of, uh, of waivers. The, but the submission is that there simply is no bad faith uh, in this, this circumstance. The, uh, there was never a request to discontinue uh, and the, the, the Attorney General's position was uh, in, the, in, in his letter to, the, uh, to ICSID that whatever the claimants did, it didn't matter. It was pointless because jurisdiction was, was lost. In conclusion, the claimants submit that uh, CAFTA Article 18.2 should not be uh, interpreted to read in a restrictive jurisdictional condition. The claimants fully satisfied the jurisdictional requirement. The claimants submit that the preliminary objection must be rejected in its entirety with cost to the claimants. And the claimants respectfully uh, request that the tribunal grant the relief requested in the claimant's uh, response at paragraph one, 101. I will now conclude unless there are any further questions. I will have no further questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Newcomb. Yeah, thank you. Those are my and this, com this, com this, uh, this concludes the rebuttal by the claimants. That's good. Um, we said there was liberty to apply before the lunch break. I see Mr. Smith uh, looking uh, with some consternation. I would like the opportunity to reply briefly. I, I assure you I will be brief, um, but, but I, would, I would like uh, maybe just one or two minutes to, to, to gather my thoughts, if you would. Okay, we have to, uh, two minutes uh, recess.